instructors, and we are hoping to learn not only uh, about the WTO and what it does and what could be done better, uh, but also what has been the experience of other groups that have tried to achieve greater transparency in whatever their activities are. Uh, we, our speakers are going to go in order. Each is going to have about 10 minutes for their introductory session. I will then go around and let each speaker respond to anything he wants to. Uh, they are all he, uh, the other four. And, and then after that, we will open it up for questions from the floor. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Alan Wolf. Alan, please. Thank you very much, Ann. Uh, thank you uh, to the Graduate Institute for hosting these sessions. Uh, and uh, to Simon Evenet for uh, uh, his invitation to me initially. Um, what we're going to talk about is uh, transparency and monitoring and how the trading system might be improved in this respect. Um, eight days ago, the G20 trade ministers met, uh, and in the report of the Saudi chair uh, on the Riyadh initiative on WTO reform, he listed an agreed list of principles uh, for the WTO, and transparency was near the top of that list. So it's recognized as an agreed uh, uh, explicit objective by all the members of the G20. They don't agree on everything, so this was something. Uh, providing transparency is more than a principle for us and the secretary of the WTO is central to our mission. Uh, in this, we tap into a wide range of resources. We certainly look to the Global Trade Alert as a source of information that we value. Uh, we see it as complementary to what we do on trade monitoring in the WTO, particularly with respect to issues such as economic support measures, which for a variety of reasons are much more difficult for us to cover. Monitoring and transparency are central to the WTO's work. Members discuss existing and proposed laws and measures in the WTO committees. They have obligations committing them to share certain information with each other by filing notifications to the WTO. Members' trade policies are periodically scrutinized. Uh, this week it's Zimbabwe uh, by each other and subject to an objective review by the WTO Secretariat as part of the trade policy review mechanism and they're subject to questions by their peers based on the report that's made available. Since 2009, the Secretary has produced a regular global trade monitoring report on how countries are using trade measures, providing a useful snapshot about how trade policy is shifting in response to changing economic and political climates. This last stream of work is perhaps the most relevant to our discussion today. Uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic and the deepest economic recession of our lifetimes. Secretariat experts have been tracking the growing number of trade measures, both restricting and trade facilitating, that members have introduced in response to the pandemic. A constantly updated list of these measures is available on the WTO's COVID-19 webpage. Members and the public have been enthusiastic about having a better handle on what's happening, to trade during the pandemic. While trade is down sharply, interestingly, uh, there's a 30% year-on-year uh, increase uh, in trade for the range of medical goods uh, relevant to COVID-19. My comparative advantage today is probably to provide some context as to why the WTO monitoring system looks the way it does and to offer some views on the strengths and weaknesses that come with it. The trade monitoring exercise here had its origin in the financial crisis, 2008-2009. At the time, many members were expressed an interest in having access to what were initially uh, a Pascal Lamy idea, uh, meant to be internal secretary briefings on how the crisis in the global financial markets were, was affecting trade. In late 2008, uh, Lamy announced that the secretary would begin circulating the reports and that the exercise would depend upon members' cooperation. At about the same time, the G20 asked the WTO, the OECD, and UNCTAD to monitor their trade and investment measures. Both initiatives continue to this day. The regular monitoring reports covering the entire membership are the only horizontal, regular transparency exercise within the multilateral trading system. Every six months, they provide a substantive snapshot of the state of world trade 
with comprehensive accounts of activities cutting across the spectrum of issues addressed by WTO rules. So tariffs, standards for agriculture, uh, standards for industrial goods, uh, and um, trade remedies, services, intellectual property, host of other areas, all coming within the scope of what the WTO does. The reports rely very heavily on stakeholder in engagement, a bargain between the WTO members and the Secretariat. Members are full partners in the monitoring exercise, reflected in the rigorous continuous verification efforts between members and the Secretariat team. As a result of this back and forth, the WTO reports may miss some things, they do, but they capture the trends that are significant. This monitoring process enhances the report's relevance because members engage seriously with the content of the reports. They actually they have no choice uh, because they really have to be involved or uh, there'll be you know, things that they don't like put out there and uh, or things that are unverified. There's clearly room for improvement. Members in the Secretariat can be bolder. Members should be more enthusiastic about full transparency as it applies to themselves and not just to others. Some members are very good about this. Uh, others, well, not so much. Uh, a number of members want to see the Secretariat empowered with greater space and leeway to report independently on issues that clearly fall within the trade monitoring mandate. We should simply be able to report on all trade measures, whatever their rationale. There are real sensitivities. There are sensitivities over sanctions. There are sensitivities about national security. But uh, we would not look into why a measure comes into play. We would uh, we would report on that a measure came into, into place. We can issue reports more often. We can update prior reports when notifications come too late for inclusion in the original report. We can tap into the trove of counter notifications and specific trade concerns to seek through secretariat expertise to discern the, uh, what measures exist. Uh, in this time of government staving off economic collapse, in a time of pandemic, there is, as we all know, a lot more public funding than ever before. The members want us to report on it. Uh, it's an open question. There's also an imbalance between those who notify a lot and those who notify a little or not at all. Again, a distorted picture would be presented. This is acceptable if the notifying members are comfortable with that outcome. Some are clearly not comfortable with that outcome. Uh, so that's a constraint. A gating question is one of resources. Simon knows this as well as we do. One aspect of transparency is not just what do our members want to know, but what will they support by stepping up to increasing a WTO budget that's been frozen for the last seven years? The trade implications of government's responses to the pandemic have injected additional energy into the discussions of what to do about transparency. For example, the Ottawa Group, led uh, by, uh, as it would sound like it does, by Canada, uh, released a statement supporting the WTO Secretariat's efforts to monitor COVID-19 related measures and called for a return to quarterly monitoring reports, expanded to cover trade-related economic support measures. The European Union and eight other members have circulated an informal document with specific proposals for better transparency around trade-related economic support measures. Currently, it is, there does not appear to be agreement uh, among members on these ideas, but there's considerable scope for discussion. Uh, in uh, conclusion, I'm optimistic about the prospects for improving transparency at the WTO. We have a lot more information than we synthesize, than we highlight. Uh, we could be providing members with much more active support to let them know what is happening in the world with respect to trade measures, both facilitating and restrictive. Members have responded very constructively to the Secretariat's real-time monitoring of COVID-19 related trade measures. It shows what more is possible, uh, even in perhaps, especially a crisis, but in normal times. There's no doubt that we can do more. I look forward to our discussion to uh, tease out uh, some great ideas on what we should be doing and uh, try to in increase the interest of our members in actually getting them done. 
Thank you, and I'll uh, look forward to participating in the discussion and hearing from the others. Barrett. Professor Barrington, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking specifically from the perspective of being uh, having expertise in the area of corruption, but I'll broaden that out to look at transparency more generally and starting off with some transparency trends around the world. So the first, which everybody will have noticed, is that uh, there is a vast increase in transparency. Uh, we see uh, lots of drives for open government, uh, freedom of information laws around the world, uh, but alongside that, we see leaks and hacks and uh, lots of sort of citizen level transparency through social media. Uh, so transparency trends are really responding um, and drawing on a tech driven world, which is, uh, has fundamentally changed the landscape to how it was maybe uh, 20 years ago when uh, transparency initiatives really started to take off. They, it, many of them had their genesis in anti-corruption objectives, um, the idea that transparency was an, uh, an antidote to corruption, but they've really moved on. So um, the anti-corruption community and the, the sort of transparency community, for want of a better word, um, run in parallel now with the transparency community taking on a life of its own. And it's moved on to many issues other than corruption, like uh, tax, um, citizens' rights, and uh, from the business perspective, the, uh, the merits of transparency in helping establish a free market. One of the uh, interesting trends I think that has really um, uh, begin to take hold is this sense that proactive transparency, whether you're a company or a government, gives you control of the agenda. So there's a sense that transparency is going to happen to you if you don't control the agenda. Uh, but by being transparent, you can uh, not simply be reactive or defensive, but you can be on the front foot in terms of information you're putting out and making available. We've also seen that uh, many um, uh, pro-transparency initiatives are what are described as multi-stakeholders. Multi so they involve uh, business and government and usually civil society sitting around the table to look at what, uh, what transparency solutions would be best to address a particular problem and how they might be implemented. And finally, on transparency trends, uh, I just want to flag um, a really crucial phrase that is uh, being used quite frequently now um, by governments, which is transparency by default. And uh, self-evidently, the principle behind this is that you don't ask, what should I make transparent? You ask, what should I not make transparent? So the idea is that you assume uh, pretty much everything uh, is made transparent, um, unless there's a reason not to. And that rather flips the uh, established approach, which is uh, uh, being generally more secretive um, and transparent when uh, required to. There are several examples uh, around the world of um, transparency initiatives, which involve uh, governments in particular. Uh, probably the largest is the Open Government Partnership, which um, 78 countries have signed up to, uh, and also a number of um, regions and cities, because it doesn't have to be a national level government that signs up to that. Uh, and uh, that deals in a number of transparency areas um, uh, and um, puts forward uh, both principles, but also implementation mechanisms. Uh, and uh, the governments um, have varied levels of involvement, but the best governments do it incredibly well. Uh, a second one is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. That's very specifically about uh, oil, gas and mining companies. 54 countries have signed up to that. Uh, they sit around the table with businesses uh, and with civil society to look about uh, transparency in the extractive sector. And that's a very good example of an initiative that started really about corruption. How can we make sure that there is more transparency about the money that flows into governments from extractive companies uh, by matching up what um, uh, governments say they have received with what companies say they have paid? But it's now, now moved on quite considerably from simply being an anti-corruption uh, mechanism to transparency for all sorts of other reasons uh, around fairness in society, fair distribution of uh, uh, revenues, uh, and so on. And finally, uh, in terms of examples, there's uh, the open contracting movement, um, uh, 
There is an NGO which deals specifically with this called the Open Contracting Partnership, but the movement is a bit wider. Um, and that is around the principles of uh, being as open as possible around public procurement. Uh, the, the sort of um, uh, countries which are leading in that are South Korea and Ukraine. Uh, other countries now uh, try to catch up, including the UK, which um, is putting in place a post-Brexit uh, procurement regime. Generally, uh, those who want to argue for the um, uh, transparency case will come from different positions according to which sector of society they come from. So businesses tend to argue that this is about having a level playing field uh, and that it creates business opportunities, also prevents uh, businesses being excluded from opportunities, particularly around open contracting, uh, when, for example, tenders are uh, put in the public domain. Um, from the civil society and citizen perspective, uh, these things are often framed around the rights to information, the rights to access information. And the government case is uh, uh, usually a bit more complicated. So partly it's about controlling the agenda, um, making sure that transparency is something that isn't done to you, but you're sort of uh, uh, in control of. It can also be um, seen as a means of supporting other policies. Um, like anti-corruption initiatives, for example, uh, or as a uh, completely non-corruption example, looking at healthcare waiting lists, uh, which might be about your policy of uh, uh, communicating to the public about your commitment to healthcare. Um, but often I think it's fair to say that uh, governments that sign up to transparency initiatives and put in place transparency um, uh, provisions are reacting to pressure from business and citizens. There are also some uh, quite strong counter arguments about transparency, uh, why uh, uh, governments or companies typically have not wanted to be transparent, or indeed citizens. Uh, one that is very strongly in the um, uh, frame at the moment is, of course, around personal privacy, um, particularly in the, the tech driven world. Uh, there are also very long standing arguments about commercial confidentiality. Those have interestingly been quite well addressed now by the transparency community. If you look for example, at the um, open contracting uh, partnership, they, they have very good documentation on where to draw the lines on commercial confidentiality. And typically a governmental one is around national security. Uh, again, there's been quite a lot of good work done on you know, what's genuinely national security versus what's a convenient argument a government uses when it doesn't want to be transparent. Just looking at trade for a moment, um, the, uh, there is, interestingly, um, uh, much more interest being shown in the issue of trade by the transparency uh, community, particularly around those issues of open contracting, um, and uh, also quite a lively discussion around, uh, which started off, I think, with uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but now is uh, very strongly there in uh, the post-Brexit um, uh, trade agreements uh, uh, discussions. Uh, what, what kind of transparency would you want written into a trade agreement um, and what should it be about? So certainly open contracting, uh, usually stuff about um, debarment, uh, about enforcement, provision and enforcement of anti-bribery legislation, those sort of things. Uh, and indeed, if you look at uh, TPP chapter 26, um, there is the chapter on transparency and anti-corruption. What interests me about that is that it's divided into two parts effectively. Um, this stuff about transparency on laws, regulations, and appeals, uh, which strikes me really as very basic stuff. I'm quite surprised that this stuff isn't transparent already, but self-evidently it isn't. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a section on anti-corruption provisions, which are broadly in line with the OECD um, uh, anti-bribery convention. So, you know, fairly standard set. Uh, but of course, it's very interesting that there is a transparency and anti-corruption um, uh, chapter in there. So I'll just finish with um, uh, three sort of key takeaways. The first is that um, transparency is definitely coming to, uh, uh, you know, across the world, to the world of trade and to you know, many other areas. Uh, I hope you like it because it's completely unavoidable. So the question really is, are you going to be on the front foot in dealing with it or on the back foot? Uh, because transparency as a sort of uh, set of initiatives has been around for uh, 20, 25 years, there's an emerging body of good practice around extractive industries and open contracting and so on. Uh, and the final point is that um, increasingly in transparency circles, trade is talked about now as one of the sort of new frontiers where transparency would be a good thing to have introduced. Uh, back to you, Chair.
Thank you very, <coughs> am I on? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Fazekas. <coughs> thank you, Anne. thank you very much. Can I have my slides up and running, please? While my slides are coming up, I'm, uh, um, thank you. Um, I would like to start off by saying that uh, um, that I will uh, try to connect to what Robert just just discussed uh, in terms of open contracting and and public procurement transparency by focusing on uh, outcomes in particular and what uh, these outcomes uh, could mean for uh, trade policy and the WTO. And I would also be happy to be able to lean back to to Alan and and his. Um, the discussion on WTO's work, high level uh, monitoring and the rules uh, the WTO is uh, you know, aiming to enforce. And I will bring in uh, uh, the micro level behavioral data which uh, follows from these, these rules and monitoring efforts and try to add um, a useful additional uh, lens. So please move on to my uh, first slide. So I will take uh, the time uh, for making three very simple arguments. The first one is that easily accessible data and transparency matter for uh, procurement outcomes, including trade. And it's very important that we are not talking about transparency in general, but transparency, which is relevant for the key actors, uh, part uh, party to government contracting, so that the, they are the users who are who can act on on transparency. So it's a very important point. We're not uh, pursuing transparency for the sake of transparency, but providing the right information for the right uh, users. My second uh, point will be, um, I guess, to some degree obvious that we have too little uh, of data and uh, transparency. And finally, I uh, will bring in two examples where decisive reform has uh, worked quite nicely. Please uh, move on to the next slide. Now, the first point is about transparency in, in public procurement and outcomes. So this is uh, um, coming from uh, an analysis which links the, the bits of information published in public procure, procurement announcements obvious things like the deadline for submitting a bid, um, uh, the description of the tender or um, contract award and the, the name of the winning bidder. So when we talk about overall transparency, we simply count the, the amount of information which is present on the announcements, mandatory information present on the announcements. And the outcome, which is very important also for trade, is single bidding. So only one bid submitted on a competitive tender and the idea here, what this figure um, captures, is that as more and more information is published, the share of single bidding is going down. So the share of tenders where there is only one uh, bidder is uh, going down. And this is coming from something which is called a fixed defects panel regression, where we really control for all sorts of uh, unobserved factors and we look at organizations uh, over time. So really the message here is that even just adding a little bit more information to the micro level, to the announcement, actually can have a real impact on uh, competitive outcomes. And this is based on over 3 million contracts for uh, a 10 year period across Europe. The next uh, slide, please. So then I turn on to my second point, which is really about that we don't have enough uh, of this uh, very useful data. And that uh, not just matters for our capacity to monitor, at the micro level poly, uh, procurement <coughs> that uh, mentioned before. So this is data from Eurostat as, as worked on by the OECD and simply states that even in Estonia, which has the highest publication rate, only 45% of total procurement spending is uh, announced in the, the EU's uh, um, uh, uh, TED uh, journal. The next uh, slide, please. But it's not just about the amount of uh, spending which is uh, reported, but the content of those uh, announcements. And this is coming from data we have uh, gathered in the Government Transparency Institute based on uh, over 50 million contracts. You see here countries uh, listed by the rate of missing information on very basic um, um, uh, characteristic of procurement contract uh, award announcements, which is whether the name of the winning bidder is uh, available, 
or whether the ID uh, of the winning bidder the supplier is available. So you could see that countries ranging from India and then Croatia, where 60 to 75 percent of the contract award announcements actually miss uh, the name of the winner, so we don't know who is uh, winning. And down to some countries like Paraguay or the U.S., where we have both the names and and the IDs of the winning bidder. So you know the information which is uh, published in an official government uh, portal or, or uh, bulletin that actually has some basic relevant information. The next uh, slide, please. So it's not just about who is winning, but how much money is being spent. And here we are tracing, uh, looking at the same 50 million contracts we have gathered. We're tracing two different indicators. One is the contract value in a contract award announcement. The other one is the contract value at the end of the contract. So the actual spending once the contract is implemented. Here, the range of countries is, is similarly uh, amazingly wide. We have some countries like Ireland, the Netherlands, or even the UK, because uh, uh, Robert mentioned the UK, which have around 50% of contract award announcements empty. You don't know. You don't know what's the contract value, right? So something is announced, but the public cannot, cannot know how much money has been really spent. Again, on the other end of the spectrum, we have countries like uh, Uganda or the US, where most announcements have um, a contract award value. And in many cases, you also have the final value, right? So you know how much was awarded price and how much you actually ended up uh, spending on that contract. Please move on to the next slide. So I'm moving on to my final and third point. After we have uh, you know, faced these, these basic facts of uh, uh, missing information, Let's look at the, the good stories. The good stories when decisive reform has delivered. And one example is the World Bank's um, support and, and the project in Bangladesh, um, almost running for, for the last 10 years. Basically, uh, they supported a comprehensive reform package, uh, reforming the rules and legislation, investing into e-procurement infrastructure, so e-infrastructure, as well as training those who are supposed to use this system. And in a matter of three to four years, they basically moved from a completely paper-based system with all sorts of errors, all sorts of missing information, to move from paper to fully electronic. A transactional system where e-procurement and e-announcements are not a second thought, but really everything is done through the system. And this uh, comprehensive reform actually delivered. Uh, if you look at outcomes such as share of single bidding, it dropped from 30% to about 15%. The share of local bidders went up from something like 12% to 21%. And also prices dropped. So winning rebates or discounts, which company, uh, companies give, that uh, increased uh, more about 7, 8% uh, rebates. Please move on to the next slide. So I'm making my final uh, point and final example here. And this is an impact evaluation for the Modoa's WTO GPA accession. This is coming from a, a model which we call a difference in differences. So we really compare uh, similar uh, uh, contracts and tenders, some which are impacted by WTO GPA accession in 2016, and some which fall below the threshold, the contract value threshold, and they are not in influenced. The, uh, the outcome we trace here is, again, a uh, single bidding. And as you see in the horizontal line, as the rules enter into force, the, the otherwise uh, parallel two lines start to diverge. And those contracts which are influenced by WTO, GPAUs, they tend to um, go down, single bidding goes down. So this means that competition becomes healthier and uh, stronger. So this is a case when WTO reform coupled with e-procurement uh, infrastructure investment and pushing uh, e uh, electronic transparency has delivered quite uh, handsome. Please move on to my final slide just to summarize my key points. So clearly, this is hardly surprising, there's a long way to go for transparency in procurement and, and trade in, in government contracts. However, we have uh, cases when incremental uh, reform as well as uh, large-scale 
system-wide reform deliver. So this is good news because we know uh, where to look and what to do. And finally, uh, I do believe that, that WTO has uh, a, uh, an important role to play here by setting standards, by monitoring requirements, also dragging along uh, uh, government systems uh, so that governments are able to uh, quickly and effectively report to the WTO and their uh, peer countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our last panelist is Simon Evident, who is also the one who uh, organized this session. For this Thank you, Anne, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to make uh, three uh, major points, and they link very nicely to the presentations which we've just heard. The first point I'd like to make is to uh, reinforce the point that Misi has just said, that decisive unilateral reform by governments can indeed generate benefits, not just for that country, but also for trading partners. I'll talk about the case of uh, Georgian public procurement reform uh, to make that point. The second point I want to make is that many discussions about improving transparency of the WTO are framed in terms of tackling the notifications deficit. And I understand why that point is made, but as Robert has said, there has been this incredible uh, tendency around the world to improve transparency at the national level. And the multilateral trading system and our colleagues in the Secretariat uh, should be doing whatever they can to piggyback on this uh, uh, unilateral initiatives in national uh, capitals. So my second message is that uh, you know, we don't have to be com completely dependent upon notifications in order to enhance the transparency of the multilateral trading system. The third message I'm going to make is the following, and it links very nicely to Alan Wolf's point, and that is that uh, we've had two systemic crises in the world trading system in the last 15 years, and the WTO has been tasked with monitoring policy developments during that era. And I think it's time for us to review the, the lessons from that uh, uh, from these uh, last uh, 15 years and to try and think through how to make the monitoring that we have perhaps more agile and I'll have some specific ideas in this respect. So let me start then with the first um, uh, observation and that is that you know all too often increasing transparency is seen in zero-sum terms and by some trade diplomats. And I think that's a mistake. We're actually having now more subtle evidence which suggests that improving transparency and transparency at the national level could benefit domestic constituencies, in particular taxpayers, as well as foreign commercial interests. And earlier this year, George Deltas and I uh, had published a, a study uh, where Georgia had systematically introduced English language notifications for public procurement bids. And these notifications were introduced um, uh, in 2011 and then scaled up in 2015. And we were able to take the changes in policy and to look at the bids for contracts in Georgia. And, and Georgia, of course, provides uh, transaction by transaction information, which is a, a goldmine for this type of research. What we found is that imp improvements in transparency brought about by having to notify or make announcements for procurement uh, auctions in English actually resulted in higher foreign participation in domestic bidding. In fact, foreign participation doubles. But we found no perceptible reduction in the total number of bids by domestic firms. And largely, I think the, you know, the point here is what we found is that the share of foreign bids was so small that actually doubling uh, didn't really eat into the market share much of the local firms. Where there was an interesting impact, however, was in the, bit, the some of the largest procurement bids which took place in Georgia, where no local firms tended to bid, and where there was typically just a single foreign bidder who, uh, who sought the contract from the Georgian government. Here we found additional English language uh, publication requirements encouraged more foreign firms to bid for those large government contracts. And it's hard to believe that that additional, those additional foreign bids did not help push down the cost to the Georgian taxpayer. So here we have a great example of how market power can be eroded through transparency to the benefit of uh, to, uh, to, to, to the benefit of Georgian taxpayers and to foreign firms who previously would not have bid for these contracts. 
So this, I think, is a, a good reminder that the, in, in the reality of improving transparency often is a lot more nuanced than a simple zero-sum view about market access. And as we have more of these studies, and including the ones that Missy has shown, I think we can make a better, bigger case for improving transparency at the national level and showing that that's consistent with being a good uh, open trading nation. The second comment I want to make relates to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, measures to try and improve transparency at the national, uh, sorry, at the global level. Here, uh, we've often framed this in terms of getting more countries to notify uh, on time. And this, of course, would be valuable and beneficial. But as has been pointed out by Robert, you know, we have seen an enormous increase in the amount of transparency that national governments have committed themselves to. And by the way, you see these increases in transparency in many countries which we would not necessarily call democratic. So many governments now post much more information on websites and the like. And I, it does beg the question whether we should uh, be encouraging the WTO Secretariat to go and source more information directly from government websites and to publish that information uh, without having to seek the approval of uh, WTO members. And so I think uh, we don't need to rely entirely on notifications anymore. Maybe they will always be the gold standard, but uh, submissions or information collected by the WTO Secretariat could well become the silver standard, the best information available, and this should add substantially. Now, with if you complement uh, the search for that information with the use of big data tools, web scraping tools and the like, then I think the sort of range of information that can be collected could be dramatically expanded. And this would add, I think, uh, to the timeliness of reporting uh, that's available to the WTO members. And I think to support all that, we ought to think about uh, the WTO Secretariat creating an open portal where governments and third parties can submit information for the WTO Secretariat to then trawl through. And uh, this might actually reduce the transaction costs of looking for this information in the first place. So I think we need to piggyback on this global, uh, rev well, revolution might be too strong a word, this global spread of transparency that Robert has indicated. Now, thirdly, when it comes to uh, uh, the WTO's own monitoring of trade policy and commercial policy developments during uh, crises, uh, here I want to make the case for it becoming a bit, a bit more agile. Um, in many ways, I'm going to endorse a number of the ideas that uh, Alan Wolf uh, put on the table. And I think here, uh, I would particularly like to endorse the idea that the WTO Secretariat updates its earlier totals, which it produces in reports, when it gets new information. It's my understanding that, especially for the six month the reporting periods, which are used for the G20 reports, uh, that information which is, uh, comes available on earlier timeframes is not used to update um, the totals for the reported earlier period. So imagine if we were reporting for 2014 and then information came available in 2016, then, what one, then you should really uh, update the 2014 totals in light of what we know in 2016. Now, I can tell you with my colleagues and I, the Global Trade Alert, that this process of, of updating when legitimate information comes available has dramatically changed the picture uh, of the amount of trade distortions which were introduced after the 2008-2009 global economic crisis. And uh, this updating process, I think, would lead to a much more uh, a realistic assessment as to what to trade policy developments were, were underway. Now, the last sort of recommendation I would make is that I think as we, uh, as we think about enhancing transparency of the trading system, we have to remember that governments are very creative about the top forms of trade distortion uh, that they use or the forms of discriminatory policy instruments they use. And so I think it's unwise to tie any transfer any monitoring initiative by the WTO Secretariat to a prescribed list of public policy interventions, whereas this would just encourage governments to substitute towards uh, uh, policy interventions which are off that list. Instead, I think a much more principles-based approach uh, should be taken, and that is that measures should be reported if they uh, introduce um, a, a discriminatory component or they change the relative, relative treatment of domestic firms compared to their foreign rivals. That should be the test. I fully endorse the point by Alan, Alan Wolf that uh, the motive that a government uses for introducing a measure should not uh, be a factor in determining whether or not an information is 
information on a, a public policy intervention is shared. Uh, we should not get into the business of assessing motive. Instead, one should have a clean test if a policy intervention introduces or expands discrimination against foreign commercial interests, it should be in. And if it or eliminates or reduces discrimination, it should be in as well. And that's the simple relative treatment test that my colleagues and I use at the Global Trade Alert. And because it's not tied to any one particular policy intervention list, uh, then of course we can adapt as governments become more crafty uh, in their uh, in their resort to uh, discrimination over time. So I, uh, let me conclude by saying this is a very exciting time for transparency in the world trading system. There's a long way to go. There is indeed a lot of interest in improving it, especially in the area of economic support uh, measures. And I should just add as a footnote, many governments are very slow to publish information on what they do in economic support measures. And this reinforces the need to keep updating the WTO's totals over time. So we have a pandemic where governments are resorting to widespread subsidization, some of which is legitimate, some of which perhaps not. Uh, and we need to have a much more um, uh, far reaching uh, set of uh, publication of information on those matters so that we can discuss their cross border consequences more openly and uh, in a more uh, a more objective and less uh, fearful way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you all for staying on time. I'd want to make a couple of comments and then we are opening up, I believe, for questions um, and discussion from the audience. Uh, I wanted to make three points. The first of which is that we've discussed transparency and we discussed some of the ways in which it's important, but it seems to me we've neglected the fact that it's also important simply for exporters in a country to know what the standards are, to know what the regulations are, and in that sense to have a better chance to uh, meet the obligations when they want to. And the same is true for importers. Importers need to know that what they're getting is what they bargain for and not something else. One of the ways in which the U.S. began standards in agricultural production way back when is simply when shipments of wheat going from the Mississippi River to Europe turned out to be much heavier than you would have expected tons of wheat to be, precisely because they did not consist entirely of wheat. There were a number of rocks in them. And the rating of wheat became about in order to protect the importers and not the exporters so that they would know uh, what they they have doing. The traders need to know that and it needs to be public for all those reasons. As Simon also points out, however, uh, there is a risk that when you impose standards for making something transparent, uh, the people who don't want to make it transparent find some even more obscure way in which to untransparentize it, if that's <laughs> in any sense of word, which I hope it's not. Anyway, <clears throat> at this point, uh, I leave it to the organizers to tell us how we get to audience discussion. But first, before we do that, let me just ask each of the panelists in turn to see if they want to react to any of the other things that the, the other uh, panelists have said. Let me start with Alan Wolf. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, one thing I'd note uh, in line with the uh, Anne comment on the uh, rocks in the in the uh, tons of wheat. Um, one of the first clay tablets that have been found uh, was from a Babylonian king to the pharaoh in Egypt saying, I really wish that you would check your gold shipments to me uh, personally and put your seal on them because what's coming through is certainly not what we, uh, what we are bargained for. Uh, so the problem's been around for a long time. Um, government procurement. Uh, this is an area where um, uh, I was in Moldova, so it's an interesting example, uh, during a, a seminar uh, given by the WTO on the government procurement agreement. And it's certainly an area in which we, uh, it is an anti-bribery area, and we ought to be pushing uh, the envelope in that area. Uh, one thing that uh, occurs to me with respect to domestic reforms that Simon mentioned, um, uh, if members uh, wish to do it, uh, accessions to the WTO are a, a matter of um, negotiation. It's whatever the members care about at the time. If they care about anti-corruption, if they care about uh, uh, the uh, uh, membership in the government procurement agreement or anything else, it's a negotiation. So they can get more on transparency in that way. And that's a lever of sorts. 
because the Article 12 members, those who come in, 36 countries came in since uh, the WTO was founded, they're rather unhappy with their level of obligations are much higher than the original members in many areas because the times move on and members' interests change. So we should use that lever. Uh, best information available. Um, that's sort of a bit of a third rail. I like it, uh, but uh, not a lot of members are going to like it. Um, and um, we do have to live with our members uh, to some degree. It's, it's a, uh, but could we be bolder? Of course we can be bolder. Um, I think that uh, the WTO has to move into competition policy, for example. Uh, the fact is that if there's a cartel in operation, which has happened from time to time in various places, um, uh, it's uh, chances are they're not publishing their minutes on the web. Uh, one has to dig pretty deep. Uh, subsidies, very difficult area to get one's hands around because um, this, there's a real definitional problem. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are in an area of, uh, uh, or an era of uh, major increases in government expenditure on specific industries and more generally. Uh, how do we cover those? We really ought to be doing it. Um, the uh, open portal to give information. Um, we have some open portals that aren't open to the public, but uh, uh, businesses raised with their governments, concerns about standards, uh, for example, in other places. And uh, we could mine this uh, tre treasure trove much more actively. It would take resources, but uh, there's a vast amount of information. It's not aggregated. So one of the misleading things about, you know, why don't we know what's going on in the world? We do know a lot of what's going on in the world. Um, and we have a lot of transparency and uh, it's not aggregated. So uh, specific trade concerns are not uh, uh, part of the, um, the overall uh, listing of measures that have been uh, put into place. Um, uh, E-notifications, uh, it's something that um, uh, we're gradually getting into in a big way, particularly with respect to standards and uh, both SPS, the sanitary and phytosanitary standards and and the um, uh, industrial standards. Uh, so uh, uh, use of FTA examples uh, in e-commerce, one of the things that was done initially in the uh, joint initiative is to look at what was done bilaterally and, uh, and uh, take that uh, on board and use it as templates for what could be done multilaterally. Uh, so there's, there's uh, a vast amount of, of what could be done. Um, and uh, uh, we'll try to push the envelope. Uh, I think a new director general coming in is gonna wanna do that. And uh, the members are looking for fresh leadership and there'll be new opportunities. So uh, continue to weigh in and uh, we'll see what can be uh, changed for the better. Some are much more transparent than others. The EU cares about state aid because it cares about competition within the what will be 27. Uh, and uh, I don't sense, but Anne would know, whether the United States really has any tracking me mechanism for what the states are doing. Uh, uh, I know that the, the US government executive branch uh, shies away from getting into state uh, subsidies or other restrictions uh, because um, that would be a, a major headache a political headache internally. Well, I I uh, benefited from this discussion so far. I look forward to further comments. Thank you. Uh, as far as I know, there is no U.S. tracking of state interventions internationally. I know there have been cases where the government the federal government and one or more of the states have gotten into a dispute about something, and there have been areas such as services and banking, uh, where in fact the U.S. has been unable to negotiate because so much has depended upon state law. So it's clearly, you probably know more about this than I do, Alan, but it's clearly an area 
uh, where there are issues, whenever there's a federal government and where the negotiating authority at the federal level does not cover the states. And indeed, in most cases, the states don't pay much attention to it. The state of Massachusetts, I think, has been the most egregious that I know of in terms of doing things that are not uh, <clears throat> sort of above board in all regards and protecting things at the state level, but they are not alone and I haven't followed it closely enough to know. So I can't help much on that one. Does anybody else or anyone else want to call on Alan said before we go on to uh, Bob Barrington? Bob, why don't you speak, react however you would like. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up on a point that Simon made, which was echoed by um, Alan, and that's about um, before you get into the business of trying to persuade governments to do things they might not want to do, uh, let's look at what data are already available and what's a way of um, synthesizing and aggregating those data. Because uh, there are huge gains to be made, and it, to some extent, the um, kind of information that Michele was um, uh, presenting and what he was talking about with regard to public procurement is is what um, has happened in the sort of open contracting and public procurement space that many governments make data available and that's you know how um, those charts were were, um, uh, were put together by Mihaly and his team um, and once you put together the data that exists first of all it gives you a sort of sense of what's happening secondly the gaps and thirdly some sense of what is best practice um, that you can then use to measure other, other uh, governments against so um, uh, Alan's right that that does take some resources. They they are often the sort of tech resources to um, make sure that where things aren't um, in compatible formats, that that basic compatibility is achieved when you're aggregating. So it's you know sort of uh, slightly basic tech work, but it's it, it's certainly achievable, and I think a, a very worthwhile objective. Okay. Any comments from Mohamed? Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, actually, Robert and uh, Anne just <laughs> took my talking points, right? I, I think we are very much uh, on, on the same page on this, that if governments pub publish official data and information informing their citizens, their businesses, then, you know, there's absolutely nothing stopping the WTO or other international organizations to take that official government data you know, using methods like web scraping and parsing that into a, a data set, applying common standards of uh, data format and cleaning, and republish it, right? You can preserve the microdata, but you can also aggregate it. And I think the, 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 um, the data science is there to do this at a large scale. I mean, we are scraping over 700 websites to get these 50 million contracts that could be easily extended to pretty much all, all WTO members. So I think the technology is there, and I think the, the, if governments are transparent, then you know here, here is the data to use it. And um, uh, as Simon mentioned, that improves timeliness as well, right? So you don't need to wait for a government sending data, but you can actually take it on a, every day to, to talk about uh, daily uh, contract analysis. Simon? I'd, I'd like to um, uh, sort of put forward a principle which I think should govern our actions in this area, which is we should not let the perfect be the become the enemy of the very good. And, uh, you know, uh, let's pick up on the area of subsidies. Yes, there are definitional questions, uh, but let's not go down a rabbit hole like that. We know what, we know some, we know what some subsidies look like. Uh, and for the ones that we know what they are, we should definitely be uh, uh, documenting them. And we should be looking at the uh, information on those subsidies, not just from uh, state records, but also from company accounts, which uh, there are a number of jurisdictions where companies are mandated by law to, re to report the subsidies that they've received from public bodies. And we should be using that information to help build the picture as well. Just as a, a footnote there, um, we have a data forensics team at the Global Trade Alert, which is working over the next 12 months to document as many Chinese, American and European Union uh, subsidies. Second point to make is on subnational subsidies. Uh, yes, indeed, I think this is a, a major area. It's a major area of contention uh, about China's um, behavior. But when it comes to the United States, indeed, there are lots of uh, 
uh, subsidies offered in a wide range of forms. There is a database of uh, revenue development bonds which are issued by, by states on behalf of private companies. Essentially, uh, this amounts to a glorified interest rate subsidy. And uh, there are thousands of those which someone one day should be putting together. So I think uh, if we were to be able to combine the, the sort of uh, expertise amongst the different, tech, different uh, transparency experts, we could make a lot of progress uh, in a public-private partnership. Uh, over the next few years, and a key part of this will be uh, the use of technology to be able to grab, synthesize, enrich uh, data in legitimate ways before it's published. So I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm actually very heartened by this conversation to see that there's so many potential complementarities which could be taken forward in the future. Thank you. And could I add one quick point or two? Um, there's a tension between policy at the WTO in many areas between policy space, which is a, a, a cry, a flag under which many countries march, and disciplines of reporting. Uh, so, there, uh, in the COVID-19 situation, uh, uh, the European Union is saying in its papers that have not really surfaced officially in Geneva. Uh, uh, we think that there ought to be a look at um, short supply, uh, the short supply provision. It allows you to put on an export restriction for short supply uh, because it calls for equitable sharing of supplies. Uh, so what's equitable? Uh, we'll see whether that gains traction or not. Uh, countries, some countries have approached me and said, we actually think that the balance is right right now where we have freedom to put on export restrictions when we think they're necessary. And they're really not very reviewable when we come down to it. Uh, one thing that uh, we're entering into, well, we, the rest of the world has entered into a digital era and we're slowly getting there. Uh, we are on this web uh, webinar. E-notifications. Um, I really think that if you change a tariff, the simplest thing or a quota, that when you have to send from a ministry a, an email to someone at the border who says now the tariff's gone from 10, 10 to 20% or vice versa. And uh, why can't it say uh, copy to the WTO? And we'd know we wouldn't wait for a rectification of schedules for a year. We'd have online immediate availability, which could be fed right out to the public instantly. So, um, and I just saw a point on government procurement. Ukraine and Moldova use their accession process uh, to overhaul their systems and leapfrog to electronic procurement. So um, uh, it's another area of policy space. We don't say you have to have that uh, in government procurement, but uh, it, the, our systems have enabled governments to move in that direction. Thank you. Let me just raise a question for the next time we go around toward the end, and that is, it was my understanding that a problem with trying to measure subsidies comparably across countries from company accounts <clears throat> is that accounting standards are different. And then to make the <clears throat> subsidy uh, calculation, one would have to have more uniformity of, so, of accounting standards across countries, and especially between China and uh, uh, the more standard international uh, gap. Procedures. If that's wrong, please someone correct me uh, toward the end. But now I would like to open it up. Uh, I would like to open it up to discussion. And what I would like next is to ask the first question. But I don't have. I could just see the private messages. I cannot see any chat message here, and I don't know what to do to get it. I'll try. I know there is one from one of your namesakes, Mr. Wolf, but I don't see the question here. So. Under chat, it is not coming up. Uh, he wrote, what can be done to improve monitoring of services related measures? Thank you. And the translators are asking whether we can all speak a bit slower, please. Okay, asking some of us privately. <laughs> is that quite as private as they meant? <laughs> Anyway, uh, Mr. D Mr. Wolf, the questioner, would you go ahead as I'd struggle again to try and find the other questions or comments? <laughs> 
not sure the um, attendees can, the participants can actually speak. So I think we just have to try and answer his uh, Rob, uh, Bob question. Okay, then could you please read them directly and, and someone just take, raise their hand or go ahead, whoever raises their hand, go first or something because I, I'm not seeing them. Okay, I'll, uh, uh, perhaps I can try and answer Bob's uh, question because this is a, it's a, it's a very, it's a very good point and Bob knows very well from the monitoring of the WTO and I should say uh, the work that we do. The coverage of goods measures is much uh, more extensive than coverage of service sector measures. Uh, now, I think the challenge here is that so much of uh, the measures which are of interest in the service sector, of course, are not the traditional trade policy measures and are tied to very specific service sector regulation. And the level of expertise necessary to track that on a systematic basis, I think, is uh, far higher. Or to actually, to let me put that differently, which is there's more commonality across good sectors in um, the uh, in the forms of uh, more tra traditional protectionism that uh, you could have someone who's an, an expert in spotting tariffs and quotas, and they could look across a lot of different good sectors. If you want to do the same in the service sector, you need someone who really understands the principles of service sector uh, regulation in each of the major service sectors, and that uh, is going to be a tall order. This will this problem that Bob's identifying will become even bigger as we start to, uh, trying to map uh, trade measures in the digital economy, where uh, at least according to my reckoning, there's at least 13 areas of law which implicate the digital economy, and this would uh, require a, a wide range of expertise. I suppose this reinforces Alan's point that in order to enhance transparency and to bring uh, expand the coverage of transparency from the, perhaps the good sector into more into the service sector and definitely into the digital economy, we're going to have to add considerably to the resources and the expertise of the teams of the WTO Secretariat, which are going to be charged with that uh, function. Thank you, Sam. Go ahead and identify the next. It's just not coming up on my screen. And uh, if I could add to that, sure. um, one of the subsidies that's out there, which is quite obvious right now in the COVID-19 situation, is air transport, where the airlines have been given an enormous amount of money. Uh, now, what's that for? The goods that come uh, beneath the passengers on the way here uh, to the market, or is it uh, to... Uh, you know, keeping them alive. Uh, how much is, you know, how do you measure that subsidy? I, you take any of these, and if we wanted, if we had the resources, you could uh, come up with some projections as to, uh, or estimates of, of impact. Um, now, Simon made the point of just report them and, uh, you know, let the world figure out later uh, what the trade destroying effect was. Um, that's a pretty wide net, you know, the uh, tax rates are uh, are going to be different in different places. Uh, we have a whole series of people in the rules division who are used to litigation about sub measuring subsidies. Um, I, to my knowledge, it's all been about goods. Uh, and uh, uh, as Simon said, services yeah, how are rates set? Uh, uh, do they overcompensate the supplier? Um, this is an extraordinarily complex area. So could more be done? I hope that uh, academics will um, and think tanks will uh, uh, sort of point the way. I, I think uh, we have a lot to improve before we get to that threshold, would be my guess. I haven't talked to the services so uh, uh, division about this particular issue, but uh, my guess is that um, uh, this this would be extraordinarily complicated, as Simon said. Thank you, panelists. Who can see the questions? Who wants to to take the next one or make a comment? Or then I will ask a question to keep the discussion going. It did occur to me as I was looking at this material a bit before the session, 
uh, that one of the interesting things is that on the one hand, we want to int we want to protect intellectual property rights, which means allowing people to keep their secrets, and we want transparency, uh, which doesn't. Uh, so I don't know how you reconcile those two. At some point, it seems to me they, they clash. Certainly, when you get to national security, uh, the right to secrecy uh, is regarded as very important. But how do you discover whether indeed it is secrecy or not unless you know the secret? Uh, and could I have a go at um, uh, responding to those questions? Because they're very good questions and, of course, um, have faced um, uh, campaigners on transparency for the last 20 years, particularly at state level, the national security question and at commercial level, those uh, commercial confidentiality questions. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, one is still on a journey in addressing those questions, but there are various areas in which they have been addressed. Um, so, um, uh, and, and a added to that, I would say there is this emerging question about uh, privacy for individual citizens. So, um, there are you know, that sort of selection of issues. Um, if you are taking a transparency by default approach, um, you're tending to um, uh, flip that and ask those who are wanting something to be commercially confidential to justify why uh, why they think it is commercially confidential, and then you can take a judgment on that basis. Um, I think in the public procurement space, what you've tended to find in the past is that uh, partly because um, public officials are um, uh, open to being um, uh, subject to legal challenge if they make a wrong decision on this, uh, they've been very reluctant to um, uh, open the gates and say, uh, actually, this isn't really commercially confidential. They've taken the word of the the bidders that this is commercially confidential information, and you know that can be right down to you know product specification or pricing models or you know loads of stuff. Um, but of course, you know some of it, of course, will genuinely be commercially confidential, and some won't. Um, and when it's not, uh, it can the motives can be various, but they can often be. Um, Either a company simply feeling very defensive about you know stuff that it's been doing for years and doesn't want in the public domain, um, or um, it can be um, uh, companies genuinely wanting there not to be an open level playing field for business by um, claiming this stuff is uh, is just um, proprietary. Um, so that's a long way of saying the way that um, I think some jurisdictions have tried to address this is they've looked at what has been written into freedom of information laws. Um, in terms of what is commercially confidential, and they transpose that across into their public procurement legislation. And that has provided a sort of baseline, which tends to go down the transparency by default route, but also acknowledges the fact that there is genuinely commercial confidentiality, and you don't want that stuff being put in the public domain and damaging commercial interests. Um, so I guess that's a long way of saying that um, there are, it is possible to draw boundaries around this, and the first boundaries have been drawn around that sort of freedom of information approach. And that seems to be working reasonably well. Um, likewise, on the national security approach, um, it, you get into the, and I, by the way, I would put defense um, in a slightly separate category here, um, because for all sorts of reasons, the national security issues are more strongly at play there. But, you know, national security arguments are often used around utilities or you know, telecoms or all sorts of other um, issues where, frankly, it's nonsense. Um, and uh, so there, I think one would again, you know, try and introduce the transparency by default principle, which is um, uh, it really test why this is national security, but require um, those who are claiming it's national security to demonstrate or prove that rather than those who want to challenge it to have to prove it. Thank you. Next contributor. And let me raise another question, which came up somewhat during the panelist discussion, but perhaps there's more. Are there lessons that the WTO could adapt for what's happened in other institutions to encourage privacy? You mentioned, of course, the uh, transparency initiative in the mineral sector, but there must be others. 
maybe I can uh, help answer that question and also respond to us a, a follow-up question that Robert Wolf has put into the chat. Uh, Robert asked, "What would the OEC, would the OECD's digital STRI be a useful approach to monitoring?" Uh, it links, I think, to the point that you're making, Anne, which is that uh, uh, we have seen at the OECD a number of initiatives to try and document uh, and characterise policy stance. Um, and of course, the area where they've made the greatest progress it was in agricultural subsidies, as, as you would well know. Uh, but the OECD has been relatively uh, quite uh, innovative in um, trying to classify policies uh, or identify policies and classify them in the services area. I think it would be fair to say that the categories that they use are relatively broad. Um, I have recently had to go through such an exercise thinking about what it would mean to document the digital economy. Uh, and uh, you, you rapidly you realize that there are dozens and dozens of policy instruments and whether you want to collapse them into broader categories as sometimes the, um, the OECD does is a little bit, uh, it, it's unclear to me. I think there is an important question here as to whether or not uh, you want to do transparency to construct indices, which is often what the OECD approach is, or whether you want to do transparency in order to list public policy interventions which is closer to what the WTO does and what the uh, uh, and, and what uh, private initiatives like the Global Trade Alert do. And I think we can uh, learn from what the OECD does, but perhaps we need to be a bit more granular uh, than uh, than they are. And we're not in the, or at least uh, the team that I work with, we're not in the business of constructing indices. Uh, we're in the business of being able to identify specific policy interventions. So I think there is something to learn from the OECD uh, work, but it's uh, it may not be. I, I, there probably isn't a case of whole whole scale copying of uh, the OECD methodologies. If uh, I could add to that, um, uh, where does this all fit in the in the overall nature of WTO reform? The, the uh, no major set of proposals has been put on the table and. and pushed through to any form of conclusion in respect to what WTO reform would be. Uh, we have a, three basic areas that every governing organization has, uh, every form of governance has, uh, a legislative function, a dispute settlement function, and an executive function. The legislative function uh, needs attention because there haven't been multilateral, major multilateral agreements uh except for trade facilitation agreement in the 25 years we've been around uh the we all know what the story is with respect to the dispute settlement function and then but where we are talking about today is what's the executive function uh what's the role of the secretariat actually what's also how do the members govern themselves to get anything done uh, and we're dealing with a group of sovereigns they are uh mostly interested here in uh so far what is binding what's enforceable uh, what new rules should exist so um uh they're very wary uh and there's a spectrum of course of views on this but they're wary of initiatives that uh, narrow their scope for freedom of action because we're in the business of adopting new binding rules. Uh, so there's a, there's a tension of that sort. Um, and uh, you'd mentioned national security. Uh, that's uh, perhaps the most sensitive issue of all. Uh, and the dispute settlement system wandered into that particular uh, uh, very difficult area in the uh, Ukraine-Russia case. And they said, well, you're at war, you two, obviously. So uh, uh, you can claim some national security cover, uh, but the way rules are tested is primarily through litigation, and uh, there's a lack of definition with respect to national security, uh, and litigation takes a long time uh, and now has its own set of problems. So uh, we differ from the OECD, we differ from the fund, we differ from the bank. Uh, the other international organizations, the multilateral international organizations, um, because of uh, our mandate and because uh, uh, perhaps uh, you don't need an independent 
the secretariat to come up with uh, loan proposal to examine loan proposals. Uh, it's a, so the the fund has uh, a lot more scope for independent action as is the bank. Uh, uh, the OECD is not negotiating new rules, and they're not so they have a lot more freedom. Uh, so th there is a fundamental question of what do members want us to do. Uh, because we're ultimately in their hands. Can we bold, be bolder? I think we can. I think that a number of the um, panelists have pointed the way of uh, uh, moving forward. If I may add um, um, to what Ellen said, so going forward and, and uh, boldly forward, I think uh, if you contrast uh, two, two big blocks, so if you look at how Brazil went around uh, information on debarments in, in procurement and debarring bidders and EU. I think it really gives you a, a, an interesting perspective of what's possible nowadays. So both uh, uh, area, both jurisdictions face the problem that there are various debarment lists, uh, subnational in the case of Brazil and federal, and these lists are disconnected, right? So you have uh, you know, Sao Paulo debars the firm and goes on the local list, but then how do you aggregate this list? And then the federal government has been asking information from the local entities and the information was not coming. The same problem happens in the EU, the European Commission does, hasn't managed to create a unified debarment list from all member states. Asking the information, the information doesn't come. However, what the federal government in Brazil decided to do, okay, this is public information. We go out, scrape all the subnational debarment lists and republish it on the federal government website. So basically, just moving ahead, not waiting for official letters, not waiting for uh, intergovernmental uh, discussions and official data submissions, simply just going out there and getting the public information and republishing. Right? And that really changes the game. And I think this is what nowadays uh, boldly going forward means. Well, the information is there. We have the tools to get it in, in a large scale. And we have the information not just to get aggregate information, to get the micro information, the level of contracts, on the level of transactions, and the level of companies. So really, there is there we live in a world where you can uh, get the micro data and also satisfy macro monitoring uh, uh, requirements. And you don't need to wait for official government communications. You just take transparency registers, government uh, uh, open data portals. And you can really move uh, a policy dialogue forward uh, with uh, new data and information. Anyone else? Uh, so, Alan, one of the areas um, uh, that uh, is held pretty much in high regard by the members uh, and uh, even by other international organizations is. Uh, peer review through the um, trade policy review mechanism. It was adopted by uh, for human rights. Uh, they have a universal periodic review that was uh, uh, modeled after uh, our own uh, uh, initiative. So the members want the, the members are proud of saying they're, they're the driving force in this organization. Um, and as long as they are driving, that is a big positive. Uh, when they're not driving, it's a little more difficult. Uh, uh, you know, how much impact do does uh, public opinion have on a large member's uh, trade policy actions? When I say public opinion, peer reaction, uh, not not what is in the Financial Times or the Economist, but uh, how much criticism is there? It depends upon the member in the situation. Uh, when uh, the Swedes put on uh, national security controls on footwear a few generations ago, uh, the derisive laughter caused them to, uh, to, to withdraw the measure. Um, you know, we live in an area of increased nationalism, uh, driven in part by increased populism. And uh, uh, members are struggling with how to move on. Uh, they put a lot of stock in a, in a new leadership here of a new uh, director general, which uh, should be announced by 
the end of the first week in uh, November uh, when the process concludes. Uh, so they're, they're looking for um, uh, a path forward. Uh, transparency is an area in which we could make progress, uh, but we'll, we have to bring along uh, our members. And But as I said, can we be bolder? Of course we can be bolder. Uh, can we do, uh, we, we're not about to unleash uh, web crawlers on uh, uh, our members. Uh, that's Simon's job. Uh, and uh, he's welcome to it. Do you think that there's any possibility of, or do you think any part of the problem is the unanimity rule within the WTO? And do you think there's any way in which it could somehow or other sensibly keep every country's claim to, so to speak, sovereignty, which of course is a to be an ambiguous concept anyway, and at the same time, enable uh, moving forward on this and other issues somewhat faster? Well, I think members find their way forward when there are obstacles. So the joint initiatives that were agreed in um, December of 2017 at Buenos Aires at Ministerial Conference 11 uh, are a way to the, the like-minded to move forward, and they're doing it. Uh, if members wanted to have a transparency initiative, they could do it. Uh, anyone who's, uh, any set of members are free to begin the conversation uh, if they care enough. So uh, uh, maybe some of our panelists can grab uh, some government officials by the lapels and say, uh, like the OECD did on, uh, but with members' uh, interest and support on anti-corruption, uh, that, um, there's a lot that can be done in the area of transparency. We do actually have members who have an interest. Uh, how they pursue it, we will see. I read this morning in the clips that the European Union's uh, new trade commissioner said that uh, they will be uh, have major proposals on WTO reform early in the new year. So uh, yeah, I look forward to that. Uh, if this is part of it, I think it would be. Transparency could easily be part of it because that's what they're discussing in the Ottawa group. Um, uh, we can move forward, but we do need, we need some sponsorship. There's a limit to what the secretariat will be able to do. Uh, although we can do more, we're not going to change the world, uh, except incrementally. Thank you. We now have just about 10 minutes left. So I think it's time for each panelist to sort of, uh, sum up by saying, taking turns, saying what they think are the most feasible next steps the w, the, that could be considered by the WTO if there were this kind of sponsorship uh, that Alan was suggesting. And of course, I, I will put Alan last this time because he just spoke on the subject. And so we'll start with Bob Barrington. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really just reiterating some of the points that have come up. And uh, first off, um, what Alan was just saying about uh, the idea of a WTO transparency initiative um, put together by a group of like-minded members, I think would be um, both necessary and welcome. Um, and as I was saying in, in my introductory remarks, it's that it, if this doesn't happen by sort of um, uh, voluntary self-initiative, then it, it's likely that it will be forced in some way. And it's far better to take ownership of it and lead and be on the front foot than somehow be forced into it. But having said that, of course, not all WTO members are going to feel the same and not all will want to take part. So I think a like minded kind of coalition is sensible. Um, and you were earlier asked a question which we didn't answer as a panel, which was um, what, what, what are examples of where this has happened um, elsewhere in the world, apart from the extractive industry transparency initiative? And uh, there are many of them um, uh, in construction and healthcare and uh, extractives and elsewhere. And generally, a determinant of success has been um, that those who were involved from the start actually wanted to work. Um, and some of the ones that have failed have been where people have been dragged a bit, a bit kicking and screaming to the table and have then undermined it and it's uh, all sort of fallen apart. So, you know, I think some kind of coalition of uh, like minded members with the WTO uh, transparency initiative would be great. Um, I slightly object to uh, Alan's uh, pejorative term of web crawlers. You know, I think data aggregation is much more noble uh, uh, sport than uh, than that. Um, and it may be that, you know, if WTO can't do that itself, it could encourage other bodies like the Open Government Partnership to do that around trade 
in a way that um, hasn't necessarily been done. So it may be that WTO could be reaching out to other partner organizations that are also intergovernmental, which do have that kind of remit and um, could take on trade as part of their, uh, you know, a, a very limited aspect of uh, trade as part of their brief, more or less on behalf of the WTO if it doesn't want to do that itself. So those would be my two, uh, two um, concluding ideas. I, I would just finish by reiterating this point. Transparency is going to happen. You know, it's not kind of voluntary and something you could avoid. So the question here is how to take ownership of it rather than how to avoid it. Thank you. And now we have Mahari. Great, thanks, Alatan. So, uh, uh, like Robert, uh, I would just reiterate a couple of key points I think uh, we, we have raised and very important. So, as I said, uh, incrementally, uh, incremental policy reform is something which uh, pays off and which, which something is, is uh, much more feasible than, than radical change uh, uh, at the WTO and also at many countries. And I think when I started my uh, presentation, I really showed that even just adding, you know, 5%, 10% more information has a measurable impact on the number of bidders on competition. So incremental reform pays off, right? So there are short-term benefits and that that is very important. And another point which um, Simon mentioned, and I, I also have a research on that, that transparency reform supports and leads to domestic benefits, right? It, it benefits domestic taxpayers, the, the government budget, right? Which is becoming increasingly important right? because we spend so much on, on COVID-19 related healthcare and other uh, aspects. So really there is a, a shared interest here, right? There is domestic uh, benefits as well as international trade uh, benefits. And the final point, I think that's the Ukraine and Moldova examples, WTO, uh, uh, joining the WTO and the GPA can be coupled with e-procurement reform, can be smartly linked to domestic reforms as well as, you know, say World Bank or EBRD coming in. And that is, has a multiply, multiplier effect, right? So you not just open up, but you also lower transaction costs, improve, um, improve the, the governance of, of these uh, systems. And finally, uh, just uh, li uh, linking to what Robert has mentioned. So when I, and I said, uh, you know, building on, on the transparency movement and, and the web scrollers, uh, I really refer to transparent data, which the governments themselves publish, right? So it's really about the governments committed to publish uh, open information, open, open, often micro-level information. So. This is for everyone, for their citizens, for the businesses, for the international community. So drawing on this information with uh, data science technologies, that is you know, in line with the, or the original government intent. So I, I believe that is, uh, again, a win-win situation, right? There is data out there on the web. Now we can make use of it, aggregate it, and you know, compare across countries, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I'll keep this brief. I, I see um, four quick lessons. Uh, first, um, aggregate, aggregate across different sources of information. Uh, intelligently, of course, uh, understanding the differences between them, but uh, we need to be uh, aggregating across lots of different uh, sources which are out there. Uh, second thing we need to be doing specifically, I think, for the Secretariat is moving away from uh, transparency based on lists of policy interventions to a more principles-based approach where we are interested in any public policy which can alter the relative treatment of domestic versus foreign firms. The third thing uh, we need to do is to start comparing what we're learning from both the official data collection exercises versus uh, the independent uh, non-official uh, exercises. And the fourth thing, uh, fourth principle I take from this is that we've got to encourage WTO members to relax a little bit. Uh, because, uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, as Robert has said, transparency is here to stay, it's coming, it'll intensify with uh, the new uh, data aggregation tools that we have out there. Uh, and so WTO members have just better get used to a higher level of scrutiny. Uh, and it would be much better to engage with the people doing this uh, than to hide in bunkers. And that's not necessarily a message for the Secretariat, but more for the, for the governments. But maybe sometimes the Secretariat has to remind uh, uh, re remind the members that uh, uh, the, the, the direction in which history is going. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Simon. And finally, Alan. Uh, 
Yeah, very briefly, I've, I've benefited from this discussion. I welcome it. Uh, we have a lot of expertise in-house that we could deploy more in the area that we're talking about. Um, and uh, actually, if things were more transparent, if we got more out there, there would be domestic constituencies, as a number of speakers uh, have said, who would um, say, ah, why do we have this policy? It's actually uh, costing the, uh, there are opportunity costs, there are financial costs. Uh, it would be useful for us to do it. Um, I agree with Simon entirely on arbitration um, and uh, higher level of scrutiny. Uh, when he says relax, I want the members to be more active in some ways and relax in others. Uh, uh, they would have to live with an imbalance of data. Uh, for example, if you list all countervailing duties, but you have nothing on subsidies, uh, you get some upset reactions uh, uh, from some members. Um, and uh, we, we, we can crowdsource, but it won't be with the public initially. It will be with our 164, is our crowd, our members, who um, uh, actually, they come to meetings and they complain about things and they seek further information. I mean, that can be mine. So um, I thank you all uh, for your suggestions and uh, I hope we can make some real progress. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, all panelists. You made my job very easy by respecting the times which we were given. And I think the discussion has been valuable and I hope it moves the whole issue of transparency forward. I certainly am encouraged by what's been suggested and I hope that our message gets through to the people who can implement it. Thank you very much. Thank you.